Bob Rod, Dick Kong, Jane Kong, and so forth. So anyway, there, Broad for Canada was amazing. And I appreciate that time away. And thank you for allowing me to do that. And thank you for praying for me. I also want to thank Jason and Carl for, for filling in. I, I want to thank Dee because he sent me the, the, the videos of that. And I was able, I'm able to really appreciate the, the, the message that both of them delivered. Thank you for that. And I realized that on Mother's Day I gave them a rather difficult <coughs> passage of scripture from which to, to put a sermon together. One chose to deal with it, another chose to find a Mother's Day message, which was great. Either way, God leads us in whatever way. But anyway, this morning I want to talk to you about a subject that is dear to my heart. And it deals with what Jesus said to his disciples just before, or weeks before he was to leave them. But let me begin first by telling you a little story. There was a, a woman who, who lived in Beverly Hills, and one day she decided that she wanted to get an ice cream cone, so she went to a nearby ice cream shop. Well, as she was standing there at the counter waiting, waiting to order her <clears throat> ice cream cone, she uh, suddenly turned around and noticed that the late actor, Paul Newman, was standing behind her. When she recognized him, she became really anxious, quite nervous. And yet she was determined to maintain her composure. She paid for her comb, and then she turned around and immediately walked confidently out of the ice cream shop. Well, outside the ice cream shop, she suddenly discovered she didn't have her comb. <laughs> she had forgotten to pick up her comb. Well, not wanting to appear foolish, she decided that she would wait just a few minutes before re-entering the store. Well, she got into the store, went to the ice cream counter, and was looking for a cone, and she couldn't find it, and began contemplating what happened to her cone. Then she felt a little soft tap on her shoulder, and she turned around and, to see who, was, who had interrupted her in her thoughts, and see, she suddenly was face to face with Paul Newman. Well, Paul Newman politely, very gently, looked into her eyes, and asked if she was looking for her comb. And she said, yes, I'm looking for my comb. And then he whispered in her ear, and he said, man, if you would look into your purse, I think you'd find her. <laughs> you know, Paul Newman, and actors like him, or individuals like him, have a way of, of having an impact on most people. And I think more famous people have that kind of effect on a lot of people, especially if you know them. But what about Jesus Christ? What about the Son of God? When He shows up, will He have an impact on you? Will He have an impact on your life? Let's look briefly at the impact of Jesus on history. Socrates, a great philosopher, taught for 40 years. Aristotle, a contemporary, all taught for 50 years. Plato taught for 40 years. And Jesus, his teaching lasted almost three years. And yet, the influence of his three years of ministry was greater than the combined years of 130 years of teaching from these great philosophers of their time. Now, Jesus wasn't a sculptor, and yet some of the famous sculptures of Bernini and Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci received their inspiration from his life and the effect that it had. <clears throat> Jesus composed no music, but individuals like Haydn and Handel and Beethoven and Bach and Mendelssohn and many of our great contemporary artists have reached their highest perfection of music as they compose melodies and words praising and glorifying Him. In practically every aspect of human achievement, of human greatness, all of it has been affected and enriched by that one we call the Son of God, Jesus Christ. But just as He has influenced our world, the most important thing that he wants to influence is you and me as individuals.
individual. So here is my question for you this morning. What would happen if Jesus were to show up in your life at one given moment in time when you least expected it to? In the text that, that Dickie read to you, Jesus said, Peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the Bible says the disciples were overcome with joy when they saw him in his physical presence. And then Jesus said again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And he added these words that I thought were incredible. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are returned. When Jesus shows up, everything will change. And so the question is, what are the changes? But, but before I begin with that, let me say this first. Jesus always shows up. He shows up when everything around you seems hopeless. When you're just confused about your life and what's happening to you. Especially if you've, you've said to yourself, I've given my life to Christ, why are these things happening to me? He shows up because he truly cares and understands the struggles that you're going through with your life. And I think that that is the most profound thing about the whole business. That God cares about us, his creatures, about everything else and was willing to give the best that he had in order to make that true. In Oklahoma City, right across from this bombed out federal building, there stands this memorial dedicated to the 168 men, women, and children that were that died needlessly because of a terroristic act by a deranged individual. At the very center of that monument is a nine-foot statue of Jesus. But this statue is rather different from statues like that. It is not a Jesus with his arms stretched out wide like you find in, in Brazil on this high mountain in Rio de Janeiro. No. Uh, this, this statue is Jesus with his face in his hands turned slightly away from that act of terrorism. And at the bottom of the plaque are these words, and Jesus wept. God weeps for us. When things seem so hopeless, and we cannot understand the why of it. We need to know that Jesus understands and that he cares about each and every one of us. And when he shows up, he will make a difference. So the question is, what are the differences that he will make when he shows up? And I'd like to mention very briefly four. First of all, when Jesus shows up, he will bring you peace. Now this peace is a different, is, is not the kind of peace that most of us think about. Free from any concerns in life, free from terror, free from um, destruction. No, this peace is, that doesn't, it doesn't come from a positive thinking in life. Where you say to yourself, oh, if I only had the right attitude, then life in itself would be better for me. It's not a kind of peace that you take when you go to the local drugstore and pop a pill into your mouth. Or when someone recommends this especially extraordinary book, and if you read this book, I think it will change your life. Or if you hear this great speaker and attend a conference, it will make all the difference in your life. No, you cannot buy it. You can't get it from Longs. You cannot get it from Walgreens. And you certainly won't find it in Barnes & Noble. It is a gift. Jesus said to his disciples, my peace I give to you. There was an incident at the Sea of Galilee when the disciples of Jesus were 
began to rise. The ship was being tossed to and fro. The disciples were concerned that the, the boat itself would overturn. And what was Jesus doing? The Bible says he was asleep. The disciples feared for their lives. And so they cried out to their master, Jesus. Oh, master, don't you care about us? We're going to die. And when he awoke, midst of this great storm, he spoke to the storm as if it was a trained monkey, and he said, peace, be still. Into that terrifying, horrifying situation, he brought peace. Well, this peace is also a gift that protects not our bodies, does it protect our heart? income or our career. It protects our hearts. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, he says these words, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ. When Paul said the peace of God will guard your heart and mind, he was using a military concept. It is a term to describe a soldier standing guard at the gate of his compound or of a building, willing to give his life for those that are inside that have entrusted him to protect them. It is a term to describe something that we cannot do for ourselves, that we are totally dependent on someone else to do for us. The truth is God's peace stands guard over our hearts, over our souls. If it's troubled, then it is there to protect us. The second difference when Jesus shows up, he will bring to us a new perspective in life. You see, until the resurrection appearances, his disciples remained confused. At first, some of them really didn't believe any of the stories that were being circulated about Jesus. All the way incredible, wild rumors that Jesus was alive and it came, especially from these women, these hysterical women. But it was only when Jesus showed up with his hand and his side in their presence that they finally believed. It was that very fact that gave the disciples a new perspective of what it means to be a follower of Christ. They knew that Jesus had been crucified, and that was a fact. They knew that his body had been placed in a tomb, and that was a fact. However, now, now they were given a whole new perspective of these events and what they meant. They knew now that death in itself was not the final end. That Jesus and all the promises that he made to his disciples were true. And when he said that he would return, and if he would return in three days, they knew that it was accurate. Jesus, his disciples, had been struggling, you see. They'd been struggling with disillusionment. They felt defeated in their life. All their energy, everything they had given up to follow this but now seeing Jesus, touching him, hearing his words, they realize that death is not the end of everything. Several years ago, a scholar by the name of Harry Rimmer was having a friendly discussion with a Muslim teacher in which they both were trying to compare their respective Dr. Rimmer said, we believe that God has spoken to us in a book, and that book is the Bible. The Muslim teacher replied, we believe God has spoken to us in a book also, and that book is the Quran. Rimmer then said, we believe that God visited this planet in the person of Jesus Christ. And the Muslim teacher replied, we believe that God has revealed himself in the prophet Muhammad. Remember then said, we believe that Jesus Christ died for his people. The Muslim replied, we believe that Muhammad also died for his people. And then River said, we believe that Jesus proved his claim 
by coming back from the grave. The Muslim teacher then replied very quietly, we have no record Since I was first ordained as a minister many years ago, I've served in churches, I've served as a chaplain with sailors and marines, and through all those years I've conducted many funerals for individuals whose loved ones had passed away, people who had requested that I would do these services. In many instances, the families went away with hope. Because they knew that their loved ones, who had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, was now with him in a place that he promised that they would go to. And that's <coughs> what I mean by perspective. Third, when Jesus shows up, he gives to each of us a new purpose in life. In John 20, 21, Jesus says, As the Father has sent me, I also sent you. Notice transformation that took place in the disciples. These men went away and were, at the beginning, rather wishy-washy about their faith. There were individuals that had big words, but nothing to back up what they had to say. But now these men who saw the Christ and touched him and heard him, now became true men of God, who the scriptures say not only shook the world, but turned it upside down. All of them except one became martyrs. No one, I tell you this, no one will lay their life down unless they truly believe in something that is worth giving their life for. And these men did that. Fourth, when Jesus shows up, he gives us a new power. When Jesus has said to his disciples, look, here, here I am. Here's my hands, here's my feet. He then breathed on them and said to them these words, receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that power. He knew that these men by themselves and women by themselves could not do anything at all unless they had something special because he knew that he would not be with them for very long. He would soon depart and they needed something. And they needed a power in their life. And that power could only be not an energy bar, not some kind of brilliant teaching, but they needed his presence in their life. The Holy Spirit dwells in each believer. The Spirit is Jesus Christ living in our hearts. And that's what he gave to them. The Holy Spirit gives us power over our weaknesses. All of us. It makes no difference who you are. There's something in your life, even right now, that is a weakness for you. It could be a sin of some kind. It could be part of your personality. Whatever it may be, there is something in your life that prevents you from fully, completely, totally serving God. None of us have the power within ourselves to live the Christian life. It's the Holy Spirit that helps us through our struggles and guides us in order that we might do His will. The Apostle Peter faced numerous personal struggles in his walk with Christ. He was an impulsive man. Whenever he opened his mouth, he would say things that he didn't think about at first. And then he would do things that he shouldn't have done without thinking. He was an arrogant man. He proudly proclaimed that he would never desert Jesus, even if it meant his own death. However, when the opportunity came to prove his worth, to prove his mettle,
and he made him into a jewel of tremendous value in God's service, just as he does with each and every one of us. The Holy Spirit also gives us power to live the Christian life. You know, by ourselves, I don't care how hard you try, you're not going to be able to live the Christian life consistently. There are going to be days when you're going to mess up. And you're going to mess up royally. And you're going to look back and then look to yourself and say, Oh, why? Why did I say that? Why did I do that? But it's the Holy Spirit that makes the potential that is in you possible. In John 7, we find the promise recorded that Jesus made to his disciples. He said, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. By this he spoke concerning the Spirit which those who believed in him were to receive. For the Holy Spirit had not yet been given, but because Jesus had not yet been glorified. And so when he made this promise to them, he promised them something that they would need to do the work that they were being called to do. Notice what Jesus said. When the Holy Spirit is given, a believer will have rivers of living water. A river has power. A river has energy. Have you ever seen a river, a major river, and how it, especially after a great winter storm, it's flowing uncontrollably. There's so much energy behind it, so much power behind it. That's what a Christian has when he has the Holy Spirit within herself. So in order for you and I to live the Christian life, in order for you and I to overcome our weaknesses, we need that kind of power and that kind of energy. So where is Jesus? He's right here. He shows up if we allow him to. This question, finally for you, who are you? Who are you when you stand in the presence of God? Let me bore, be bold by telling you you are a soul created in the image of God for whom God sent his son to deliver you from evil and to remove your sins. God has forgiven us. We are to forgive each other. Guess what? We are to forgive ourselves. You see, by forgiving us, God freed us from guilt. And when we forgive another person, we free them of guilt. And when we forgive ourselves, we experience what it means to not have guilt in our life. I tell you this, my sense of self-worth comes not from examining myself and going around and saying, Wow, Tim Morita, you're not so bad after all. Oh, but that's not true at all. You see, when I gaze at God's love, I discover that nothing can stand between God's love and me. All because I know myself to be completely loved and accepted because of what has done, been done for me when Jesus went to the cross and what the Holy Spirit continues to do in me. And so I end by saying this to you. May God be present in your life and may you allow Jesus to have his way in your life. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are present here with us. And especially those who are struggling with their life, needing to know and feel know with a certainty that, that they're not walking alone. Thank you for these words that we have, that you are with us. Now we pray, Father, for those that do not know you, that are trying desperately to find meaning in their life. We pray, Father, that this moment that they may might allow you to be present by allowing you to come into their hearts. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. This morning, as we enter this time of 
dedication and commitment. Let me invite you to search your hearts and ask whether Jesus Christ is present in your life right at this moment. Is he in your heart?